All right, now this is part two of a four-part series on facial trauma 2018. The first section was just an introduction to all the different types of facial traumatic injuries you deal with. This section here is based on treatment of these injuries from the emergent to the early to the definitive uh, part of their care. So the first topic when it comes to stepwise management of cases, of course, is emergency management. And this is going to be divided into two portions, the immediate and the urgent. The immediate always is the airway first. If the patient can't breathe, you can't exchange oxygen, then you're going to lose the battle. Beyond that is management of hemorrhage. If you've got vessels that are bleeding, that needs to be controlled. And hand in hand with that is management or prevention of shock. Once you've got the airway under control and bleeding under control, then you can attend to the other more urgent needs, which are uh, neurologic status, which is basically evaluation of the head and the neck, making sure they've got a stable neck. You're not, not going to end up with a paralyzed patient, or if you do have one, you know where it's at. Beyond that is chest and abdominal injuries, particularly with motor vehicle and mo motorcycle accidents, where there's a high risk for uh, uh, intra-abdominal trauma and bleeding, as well as uh, multiple rib fractures and that sort of thing. Lastly, extremity injuries, uh, and that goes part and parcel with the mechanism of injury. So when it comes to emergency management and airway maintenance, it's a stepwise process again. Uh, beginning with removal of clots and debris. You're going to have a lot of loose and broken teeth, dirt in the wounds and that sort of thing, and that needs to be cleaned out immediately, especially to prevent aspiration of foreign bodies. Beyond that, you can put the patient in a lateral head position if they have a stable neck, and that keeps them from swallowing uh, foreign materials and teeth. Uh, again, if you've got a patient in a supine position and you want to maintain the airway, traction of the tongue forward, either with a clamp on the tongue, a towel clip through the tongue, or actually a, super, uh, a uh, suture uh, tied to the chest wall uh, can keep the tongue forward for you and maintain the airway. Ultimately, though, endotracheal intubation is the procedure of choice because it's relatively non-invasive and gives you the most secure control of the airway. It can be done either orally or through the nose, uh, nasally. And uh, for the type of work that I do, nasal intubations are very preferable. Uh, beyond that is tracheostomy, and that can again be either on an emergent basis in the event that you've got a failing airway and there's no other way to get a hold of it, or it can be done under a controlled situation. Now, if you'll recall, or if you happen to have seen the first of this four-part series on just basic types of facial injuries. Many of these examples were shown, but I'll go through the list on what are the, the cases that really do require tracheostomy. One is a flail chest, and this you oftentimes see with motorcycle injuries or rodeo type injuries where people have had a crush injury to the chest with multiple rib fractures and you get paradoxic expansion and contraction of the chest where on inhalation the chest collapses and on exhalation the uh, chest expands, and this becomes an indication for a tracheostomy. Obviously, fractures of the larynx and trachea, again, I, there was a picture that demonstrated that. Severe wounds at the base of the tongue, such as a gunshot wound injury. Crush injuries to the face and neck, obviously, you need to have control of the airway. Avulsion of a portion of the mandible, which is very typical in gunshot wounds, particularly suicide attempts. Multiple facial injuries requiring general anesthesia, in other words, complex cases with multiple gunshot wounds and multiple facial fractures. Second and third degree burns of the face and neck. Again, with scar contracture, this is not so much on an emergency basis, but on a long-term basis, these can be very difficult cases to manage. And then lastly, where you've got maxillofacial injuries associated with a closed head injury and unconsciousness with the patient's basically comatose or they're, they're brain dead or whatever. And in that sort of situation, they're not able to protect their airway and they're basically going to be a, a maintenance case where a tracheostomy is indicated. Now, once you've got your airway under control, which is, as I mentioned before, the first and foremost of all your uh, uh, items requiring attention, then management of hemorrhage becomes your next goal. And so pressure alone oftentimes controls minor capillary type bleeding. And the same thing, local type measures such as injection of lidocaine 
which is local anesthetic, along with epinephrine in it, will give you vasoconstriction, can stop minor bleeding that's not of significant vascular diameter. Beyond that, though, ligation of severed vessels, particularly arterial bleeding, is an absolute necessity and can be accomplished with relative ease. Along with blood loss, though, you have to replace it either with crystalloid, that's fluid replacement, um, such as dextrose or saline or lactated ringers. And then uh, if you've lost a significant amount of blood, then actual blood product administration, packed red cells would be the procedure of choice. Part and parcel with management of hemorrhage and prevention of shock, you have to monitor the patient's vital signs, their PO2, their hematocrit, their urine output, and their neurologic status. All of those things fall together in management of hemorrhage and prevention of shock. So now, if you'll recall, we've gone from the emergent management of the case into what's called the early management of the case. And this is where you've got your patient stabilized. What are you going to do next as far as figuring out what's going on with the case and how are you going to treat the patient ultimately? So if the patient has open wounds that need to be debrided, you do that either with just irrigation or scrubbing with a brush to get all of the tattooing dirt out of the and pavement out of the wounds just doing whatever it takes to clean things up as much as you can. If you've got jaw fractures, then temporary mobilization of the jaws is indicated with application of arch bars and or wires. If you've got avulsive injuries where teeth are lost and bony segments uh, are missing, then securing of impressions uh, can be helpful as far as building splints. And again, we get into this early management of the airway. Now, you, if you went to the emergent management of the airway, it was endotracheal intubation. If you know that you have a patient who's going to require multiple procedures or going to be in a, a situation where their airway is at risk, and then tracheostomy does become indicated and to be done under controlled as opposed to emergent conditions. Beyond that, supportive measures, which you already talked about to a certain degree, which is both uh, nutritional uh, as well as uh, just fluid uh, volume maintenance and that sort of thing. And at this point, you figure out whether you need to get consultations from whatever services would be necessary, depending on the patient's uh, injuries such as neurosurgery, ear, nose, and throat, ophthalmology if you've got an ear injury, general surgery if you've got belly problem, vascular injuries, cardiothoracic, orthopedics, pediatrics, internal medicine, and cardiology. I only add plastic surgery in here out of courtesy because the average oral and maxillofacial surgeon can manage facial soft tissue injuries just as well, if not better, than a plastic surgeon. Now, if you'll recall, we've gone through the emergency and early management of the case. Now we're down to definitive management of the case. You have your patient stabilized. You've figured out what their uh, problems are. You've gotten the consultations that are necessary. Then definitive management of a case oftentimes involves appropriate radiographic interpretation. So in this day and age, CT scanning gives us a lot of information, but it doesn't give us everything. And conventional x-rays are still very helpful in managing cases. I'm going to show you multiple examples of how this can be. Beyond that, once you've got your radiographs, you've got your splints made, you've got everything um, finished that, to prepare the patient for surgery, then you take them to the operating room. And the two rules are you start with the bone and work from the inside out, and then with the soft tissue, you manage that last once you put all the bones back together. And you work from the bottom to the top as far as the facial bone reconstruction. The most common and irritating problem that we run into is the patients present to the emergency room, they've got a major soft tissue injury or even a minor one, and there's such a um, rush okay, to get that soft tissue uh, repaired when you know that you're going to have to go back through that mouth and oftentimes destroy the repair that was done. It should be better off left alone so that the patient is managed appropriately from the inside out. And then lastly, closure of soft tissue is accomplished and will not have to be done a second time. So when it comes to radiographic evaluation, there are multiple conventional skull films that are going to be a considerable value to you. PA and lateral skull, and I'll show you an example of that. Submental vertex has its uh, benefits in certain cases. Three views of the mandible is not that 
uh, helpful, but it does help show condylar fractures. The town's view of the condyles is very helpful in showing condylar fractures. Water's view is to uh, clear, uh, show clearly the sinuses. The panorex, though, is the workhorse of all of these, though, because it shows gives you so much information about the lower two-thirds of the face on a single film. It's indispensable. Beyond that, cervical spine films can be helpful, uh, and not only just to rule out uh, cervical spine injury, but also to just help in identification of objects as well as endolateral neck for foreign bodies. So radiographic evaluation, the minimum is two films every time. If you only had two films to get that are going to be of benefit to you, a panorex, as I mentioned earlier, is the real workhorse, and a chest x-ray. And the reason you get a chest x-ray is to make sure that you haven't got aspiration of foreign bodies, you don't have fractured ribs, and that sort of thing. So it's essential, especially if you're going to be putting your patient to sleep. And not everybody has a CT scanner. CT scanning is good, but plain films still have their place. facility has a CT scanner so that you need to be able to localize uh, an image three-dimensionally and those are done with a PA skull, lateral skull, and submental vertex. The other useful films are panorex, sinus films, and 3D. This is one lesson in that where you can see that the knife looking in the frontal view it looks as if it's right dead center in the middle of the skull from the top. When in actuality, when you look at the lateral skull, it's barely through the posterior table there. Here's another one where you've got 3D localization. It looks like the patient has a large bullet fragment directly between the eyes, when in reality, it's in the back of his scalp uh, rather than being between the eyes. So other adjunctive types of uh, imaging besides plain films, you've got CT scanning, tomograms, MRI scanning, angiography, and arthrography. And so these have their place, and I'll show you examples of those. On CT scanning, this is a layer-by-layer -layer cut. This one here helps you get a real good look at the condylar heads, in particular evaluation of mandibular fractures. Here is another way to evaluate the mandibular condyle. This is with a layer-by-layer -layer cut in a sagittal plane here on plane films. And again, it shows the shape of the condylar head as well as the external auditory canal. An MRI scan, on the other hand, is not as beneficial in showing you bony anatomy, even though this does show an intact condylar head. It's better for elucidating what's going on with the temporomandibular joint meniscus between the temporal bone above and the mandibular condyle below. Here we have angiography, which is obviously helpful in a case we've got a bullet in the neck and to, be, to prove that there's no vascular injury. Lastly, TMJ arthrography, which is becoming a lost art because very few radiologists even know how to do it anymore. But this is a dye injection study for evaluation of the soft tissue component of the temporomandibular joint to determine what condition the temporomandibular joint meniscus proper is in. Ooh. Yeah, those. Yeah, that went a lot better. All right, I'll edit these. See if I can get it converted into video by today. Okay. Your mission. <laughs> Good. We'll have two of them up there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool if these became uh, viral. I don't think so. Yeah. The other alternative is we can try to run and link to the YouTube video as an ad on Facebook. And that's basically like buying a thousand views. And from there, I figure like people might share it if enough people are exposed to it. Uh -huh. Cool. Okay.